grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. God's mercy endures forever. Guess I could have looked. <laughs> Didn't look down correctly there. We'll go from that to, to reading the psalm. Um, so looking at Psalm 51. You're being back in for the Okay, so you can turn to Psalm fifty one. And uh, we're reading verses 1 through 17, Psalm 51. To the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words, and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, nor would I give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, and a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing you have made, and you forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our unworthiness, may obtain of you, the God of all mercy, forgiveness and cleansing of all unrighteousness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. If you'll stand with me and we'll begin in singing Medley in Christ alone, Lamb of God, and Jesus paid it all.
solid ground, perfect with his crown and soul, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of lesson from scripture in Isaiah the 58th chapter reading verses 1 through 12 Isaiah 58 beginning at verse 1 Cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. 
They ask me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have they fasted and you see it not? Why have they humbled themselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast you seek your own pleasure and openness and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours these this day will not make your voice be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose? A day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes upon him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is, not, is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and to bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked, to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and the speaking and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out from the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places, and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fall. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt, and you shall rise up the found, raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach the restore of streets to dwell in. The word of the Lord. And then turning over to 2 Corinthians in the 5th chapter, if you're looking in the Pew Bible, page 1,228. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Beginning at verse 20. And we'll read down through chapter 6 in the 10th verse. Second Corinthians. Get it there? Yeah. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 5, beginning of verse 20. It's page 1228 in, in your Psalter. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For your sake be made to him, for our sake be made, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, 
In a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with your ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves to every way, by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. The word of the Lord. If you'll join in your hymnal, number 480, and we'll sing together, uh, Have Thine Own Way. You can stand with us, number 480. Matthew 
in the sixth chapter, and reading verses 1 through 6, and then going down and reading verses 12 through 17. Or tw uh, 19 through 21. Uh, I want to back up there. I know what I wrote there. We'll go to 16 through 21. So verses 1 through 6, and then we'll go to 16 through 21. Matthew chapter 6. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret may reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corner that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And going down to verse 16. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up treasures on earth. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. As we uh, think back through this passage in Matthew, we see Jesus gives four injunctions, four instructions. He says, when you give to the needy, when you pray, when you fast, and lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. The when in that one is implied uh, that you're doing it. And you notice as he, each one of these, it doesn't say if you do it, it says when you do it. So it is presumed that this is going to be the pattern of Jesus' disciples. And so as we think about these ways in which we practice our faith in very practical ways. Now most of the time when we hear giving, we tend to think cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Oh, here's the church again telling us, we need to give more money. And uh, yeah, there's a value and a purpose in giving money uh, and the resources and things that the church does and giving to ministries. Um, there's an importance in giving the tithe, that 10% of the gross income and keeping the ministries going. There are the offerings, those special things like we'll do uh, this month with alabaster that are those things above our tithe. Uh, those are all good. But there's more to giving than just money. The greatest poverty in the world today 
is human relationships. Knowing that someone truly cares, that someone will be there to help or just to be there. Uh, you probably have seen these uh, little outtakes around Christmas time of surveying kids and saying, what would they like for Christmas? And then it goes on, well, if you have the choice to receive this gift or have time with mom or dad, which would you choose? And invariably the kids say, time. What they want is a person, the loved person, the, the person who cares about them more than any object that we can give. So we think about when we give to the needy, oh, here's just something else we give money uh, to do. But think, how else can we give? What are the, the real needs in a person's life? And how can we really touch them where it really counts? Jesus says, when you pray. And he then follows that passage with the Lord's Prayer, teaching them to pray. And um, Diana's uh, started working now with the kids on teaching them the Lord's Prayer. Um, and that's going to be neat to hear. It's been fun to hear them go through the Ten Commandments. It's going to be neat to hear them as they learn to say the Lord's Prayer. And, um, you know, they're, they're going to learn to memorize that. And, and it's, it's good. It's something that we do quite frequently in services. And so they'll be able to chime along with that. But the function of even memorizing it is not just to say that we can out the prayer. But it's so having that in our hearts, in our mind, that we can do as the psalmist says in Psalm 119, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We hide those words in our heart so that we can think about what is behind the words. What is the, the true intent and the meaning, the depth of those words? And, and as we think about the Lord's Prayer, we've done that before, gone through and broken down the, the different aspects of the Lord's Prayer. We notice that very little in that prayer has anything to do with asking God to get us things. It's, there's not prayer in there of God take care of my ingrown toenail or even take care of my cancer. The only one there is give us our daily bread and that's just give us the basic sustenance of life. Nothing elaborate, just basic sustenance. And even that meaning of daily bread is greater than just bread uh, that's made with flour and water. Give us that which we really thrive and need in our lives. And, and so as we think through those prayers and we think about the different lines, what is the real heart in the Lord's Prayer? And Kelly's going to have fun with that as she you know, gets to recite that and work with that with her too. And, and talking to them about, great, we've said that, so what does that mean? What does it mean to pray those things? Our Who art in heaven? Hallowed be thy name. And to break down and think. And is that the real shape of the prayers that we did? Listen to ourselves the next time we pray. How much of it is focused on what we're asking God versus what it is that we truly need in our lives? We need God's presence his direction, his strength. And then he says to fast. And it's interesting as you look at those verses, he doesn't say how to fast, but there is an implication in it that there is such a thing as a wise fast. That fasting is a very worthy per practice and Though we don't hear much talk about it today, uh, and fasting from food is a, 
a great way to, to recognize that I crave things and need things more than food. Though when you do fast from food, the thing that will first come to your mind is how much I need food. But that's a distraction more than a reality. And we have to push through the distraction to see what is it that I truly need. I need the presence of God in my life. And, and as most people, when they're fasting and something like they get grumbly, they get agitated. And that's not true just with food. You could be fasting television or fasting uh, social media or any of those things. And we think, oh, where is it? Oh, I need that. I got to have that. I can't do another hour or another day without that. And, and as we begin to go through that, we realize that there's something healthy about creating balance in our life. As I mentioned Sunday about looking at how much time do I spend on my cell phone? What is the balance of that in my life? To, to create a practice of discipline in our life. I'm only going to do that for so much or at a certain point of time and nothing more than that. Not just when I feel like it, but I'm going to ration myself to something. And to realize that it's important to not to become a slave to a habit. That, oh, I feel that buzz. I feel that jingle. I feel that, oh, I've got to go answer that. You know, oftentimes we're sitting and eating and um, one of our phones will have that little buzz. And, the, you know, to stop ourselves and say, I don't have to go look at that. I don't have to have that. I'm not a slave to that. Um, to learn to be able to do without things. William Barclay says one of the greatest tests of life is to consider how many things are truly essential to us? Or how many time things do we think are essential to us? And the less the number, the more independence we have from the world. And the more that we're able to focus on being with God and being who God wants us to be. And then sometimes just doing without something, fasting, helps us to appreciate something. That, um, you know, when you haven't had dessert for a while, and then you get that dessert, and it's like, ooh, really enjoy that dessert today, because it's not something I get to do very often. Well, the same thing is true. It's like, oh, well, that was nice to be able to talk to that person or watch this show or to do something. That was good. That was fun. But I don't need that to control my life. It was an enjoyable thing. But I don't have to have that. And the last point that Jesus makes is laying up for ourselves treasures in heaven. And Jesus divides treasures, or at least what people regard as treasures, into two categories. Those things that are temporary and those things that are permanent. The temporary things are the things that moths can destroy, rust can destroy, and thieves can steal. Think about how much there is in our life that fits into that how we build our life around things that moths can destroy, rust can destroy, and thieves can steal. But what really matters is that which is permanent, that which is stored up in heaven. I remember a number of years ago, a friend of ours at a church when we were in Toledo, talking about that his mother had passed away and that she, in his mind she was the wealthiest person in the world. And it wasn't because she had 
material possessions. He said her wealth was in the fact of knowing that she was going to heaven and how many people she could count that she had helped lead to Christ. Those were the things that really mattered in life. Those are what really endure for eternity. So we think about deeds of kindness and not expecting reward for those things, but just doing them because they're the good thing and the right thing to do. Building character into our lives. Um, is that, that's been a, a, a part of, a significant part of my writing uh, these last couple of weeks in developing on the dissertation is about the importance of pastors developing spiritual character. And how critical that is for the church as a whole, but for their own lives to have a spiritually healthy life. And so to think about those are the things that endure, those patterns, those practices, those virtues in our life that outweigh and outlast anything. And what one treasures in our heart is where the focus of our life is. The things that we hold dear and sacred are what drive us and determine us. If it's those temporal, temporary things, then ultimately our life will be wasted and destroyed. But if it is those things that are permanent, eternal, heavenly, then our life will be blessed now, and the lives of others will be blessed by that, and it will be blessed eternally. So as we think through these injunctions in the Lenten season, we're challenged to think about how can I direct my life around those things? How can we give more? Not just money, but give better to those who are in need. How is our prayer life? What is the focus of our prayers? Not just how much time do we spend in prayer? What is the focus of our prayers? Is our prayer life focused around the list of things we're asking God to do and get? Or is the majority of our prayer life seeking the presence of God? God is what will last. Somebody gets well, gets over a disease, or get some material thing that they need, eventually that will go away. But the presence of God is something that lasts forever. What could we fast? What could we discover in our life that we really don't need? What treasures could we lay up in our life that will focus our life around Jesus Christ. So as we think about uh, preparing ourselves in the Lenten season, may these words of Christ give us impetus in directing our life. From the early years of the church, Christians observed this great devotion, a, a time of the Lord's passion and resurrection. And it became the custom of the church that before the Easter celebration, it would set aside this 40-day season called the Lenten season, a time when persons would search their heart and lives, confess their failings, are reconciled by penitence and forgiveness, and devote themselves to Christ and new Christians are prepared for baptism. The season reminds us of the need for self-examination and the renewal of our faith. 
And so as you enter into this Lenten season prayerfully, how will you ready yourself to celebrate the resurrection and serve Christ? What will you do over the next 40 days to strengthen your faith and walk in the way of Christ in the Gospels? Our outward practices will demonstrate the inward transformation and the readiness of our lives to journey with Christ. Tonight, as we're marked with the cross of salvation, a cross of ashes, we enter into the journey. Let us do so with our heads up and our eyes forward to what God wants to do in and through us. As we go to prayer, take a moment and just confess whatever you need to confess in silence for the Lord. Ask for his forgiveness. Let him speak to you about what direction that you need to go in your life. And, um, and to use that in this Lenten season, let us pray. May the almighty and merciful God, who desires not the death of a sinner, but that we would turn from wickedness and live, accept our repentance, forgive our sins, and restore us by the Holy Spirit to newness of life. We'll join together in the Lord's Prayer using the words that are written and recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. Grant that these ashes may be to us a sign of our mortality and penitence, so that we may remember that not only by your gracious gift are we given everlasting life, but that only by your gracious gift we are given everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Savior. If you'll take your hymnal and turn to number 343, and uh, we'll sing together a cappella, just as I am, and uh, let's see, I think we'll, 343, um, we'll sing the uh, first, second, and fifth verse.
remember that from dust you came, from dust you will return. Repent and believe in the gospel. I invite you to come as you are willing and able to come and to receive the imposition of ashes.